In this layer for side video, we're going to look at the three common organometallics, including the Grignard, Organolithium, and Gilman reagents. Organometallics are great for new carbon to carbon bonds, including chain elongation, opening rings, attacking carbonyls, and more. But let's start at the beginning. The name organometallic comes from the word organo, meaning carbon, and metallic, meaning metal. When carbon is bound to a lower electronegativity metal, carbon is going to have a partial negative charge and the metal a partial positive charge. Wait, wait, let's back this up all the way to polar bonds in general chemistry, which I cover in more detail at the link below. To remind you that when you have a bond between two atoms, we look at the difference in electronegativity between atom A and atom B, and if that difference is significant, you'll have an unequal sharing of electrons. For example, if atom A has an electronegativity of 2.0 and B is 0.7, the difference is 1.3, telling us that the more electronegative atom A has a partial negative charge and the less electronegative atom B has a partial positive charge due to the unequal sharing of electrons. We've already seen carbon with a partial charge. For example, the partially positive carbon in your substitution elimination reactions when bound to an electronegative halogen, or the partially positive carbon on a carbonyl when double bound to an oxygen due to resonance. In both of these cases, carbon being partially positive makes it susceptible to a nucleophilic attack. But that's not the case when we're looking at organometallics. Carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. Magnesium is 1.2 for a difference of 1.3. Lithium is 1.0 for a difference of 1.5. And copper is 1.9 for a difference of 0.6. Notice that the difference is greatest between magnesium and lithium, making these two more reactive, which will be important for later reactions, and copper at 0.6 is a lot less reactive. But what's most important is that in each case, carbon is more electronegative, making carbon the reactive species in the organometallic reactions. Why is this important? Carbon is not very electronegative. It does not like to hold a negative charge. And when it's forced to hold that partial charge, it acts almost like a carbanion almost like carbon has a lone pair of electrons, is so unstable and therefore wants to attack. Organometallics can act as both a nucleophile and a base, the difference of which I discuss in the video link below. Now that we understand the basics, let's look at the individual organometallics, starting with organomagnesium or the Grignard reagent. The Grignard reagent is the most common organometallic that you're going to see in organic chemistry with the following structure. An R group bound to magnesium metal, bound to a halogen, most commonly bromine, but you'll also see chlorine and iodine. The Grignard reagent is formed when you react a molecule that has a halogen on it, for example, an alkyl, a vinyl, or aryl halide, in this case I have bromobenzene, with magnesium in an ether solvent such as diethyl ether or tetrahydrofuran, to give you a product wherein the magnesium inserts itself in between the carbon and the halogen. Fortunately, you're not responsible for the radical mechanism. You only need to understand the product. We have a partially positive magnesium bound to a partially negative halogen and a very partially negative and very reactive carbon. This carbon here will act like the carbanion in the Grignard reagent. A solvent like ether is very important because the negative oxygens will donate their electronegativity and complex with the magnesium metal as follows. If oxygen is a good solvent atom, why not just use something like water? Very simple. Remember we said organometallics can act as a nucleophile and a base? The expected reaction of a Grignard with epoxide is for the Grignard to attack the epoxide and open the ring, but in the presence of a polar protic solvent like water, Grignard will go for the easier proton in an acid-base reaction to grab that hydrogen give oxygen back its electrons, completely destroying the reagent. CH3 is now bound to water's hydrogen, giving a methane gas that bubbles out of solution, along with an epoxide that did not undergo a reaction because there's no Grignard left to attack it. And so you want to make sure your solvent 
while contributing the electronegative oxygen doesn't inadvertently destroy the Grignard because it also has a polar protic component. Why does it attack the proton rather than the epoxide? Simple. Molecules are lazy, they look for the easiest reaction, and if you look at the reactivity between the carbon on epoxide or the proton, the proton is a lot more reactive and therefore the atom that gets attacked. Grignards will undergo many different reactions from opening epoxide rings, attacking carbonyls, and even a double attack on carboxylic acid derivatives like this acid chloride. In fact, because there are so many, I have an entire tutorial and Grignard cheat sheet on my website linked below at layerforsci.com slash Grignard. In each situation, after the Grignard attacks, we're left with an O- that we need to add a source of protons for a neutral alcohol product. Only add the water after the Grignard completed the reaction, meaning in step two, so that you don't inadvertently destroy the Grignard by adding the water too soon. The next organometallic we'll look at is the organolithium, which as the name implies has organo, a source of carbon, bound to a lithium atom. If you look back at the periodic table, you'll remember that lithium in group one only has one valence electron and is very reactive. And so when lithium gives off that one electron to give us Li+, we have a redox reaction. In this case, oxidation, where carbon the recipient gets reduced as follows. If I have an alkyl halide and react it with two atoms of lithium, I get an organolithium plus LiBr. We need two lithium atoms because carbon will require two electrons, one from each lithium, to become carbanion-like, bound to that spectator or partially positive lithium. The second positive lithium will hang out with bromine somewhere in solution. If you remember our polarity, lithium gives us the most electronegative carbon and is therefore most reactive even at cold temperatures, which is great for coupling reactions where other reagents typically don't work. For example, say I have this vinyl alkyl halide and I want to extend the carbon chain without losing that pi bond. Simply take that carbon component that you want to add to the molecule and introduce it as an organolithium. Are you with me so far? If yes, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out on any new videos. Last but not least, let's take a look at organocuprate, also called the Gilman reagent or the diorganocopper reagent. This is a more reactive form of just a carbon bound to a copper, because if you'll remember, the electronegativity difference between carbon and copper is very low. In fact, copper is so slow to react that to even make this, we need to start with a stronger organometallic, you guessed it, organolithium. If I take my organolithium and I react it with copper iodide, I get what is called a transmetallation reaction where the metals swap places so that the carbon chain is now bound to copper and lithium iodide wanders somewhere in solution. And so I take my organocopper reagent and I attempt to react it with a carbonyl, like this ketone, and I get nothing, no reaction. It is not strong enough to attack where the other organometallics would. And so we give this reagent the power of a second carbon to make it slightly more reactive so we can get something out of it. When I react organocopper with organolithium, I get a copper atom that is now bound to both R groups with a negative charge countered by a positive lithium. You don't have to show all these steps. Instead, you're more likely to come across something like this. Two alkyl halides reacting with two lithium, like we saw before, to give us two organolithium, which you then react with copper in an ether solvent to give you your Gilman reagent, which is two R groups bound to one copper and one lithium. The second positive lithium hangs out with a halogen somewhere in solution. Remember, copper is still not as reactive, but it's reactive enough to give us some very key reactive situations. Remember how Grignard attacks an acid halide twice? 
Because the Gilman reagent is less reactive, it'll only attack the acid halide once, stopping at the ketone. Another place you'll see a clear distinction is the Michael addition, which I discuss in detail at the link below, where the Grignard will do a 1-2 attack directly at the carbonyl, where the Gilman will give us a 1-4 attack at the pi bond position for two very similar yet very different products. For even more on organometallics, visit my website link below at layerforsci.com slash metallic. The link again is layerforsci.com slash metallic.